Well, hello and welcome to the Sindel Baptist House Church service for today. My name's Mike and I'm part of the team here. And whether you're watching this on your own or you've linked up with others via Zoom, I'm so glad that you can join your house with the households of many others who make up Sindel Baptist. As we gather online to worship God and grow as followers of Jesus, there's a tangible sense that even though we may be physically separated, we still get to do this together. And so I'm thankful that you're here in this moment. Later in this service, we've got our senior pastor, Chris Danes, bringing the third installment in our current series called I Know This Much Is True. But right now, we first get the chance to worship our God through song. So let's sing together for God is worthy of our praise. Welcome to House Church, everyone. It is great to have you here today. I thought as uh, we start our service today that I would um, remind you about what praise and worship does. Um, When we sing to God, we remember who He is. We return to that relationship between the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit that we're connected with and we reconnect um, with them as we sing our praises. So why don't you stand with us as we join together in worship.
Nothing compared. 
It breaks all chains. We believe it today. Amen. Well, how good is it that in our separate households, we can sing the same songs with others in this church? A special thank you to all those involved in curating and preparing that moment for us. I also want to continue to honour you for your ongoing faithfulness and generosity each week as you contribute to the offering, especially in a season where there is a lot of financial strife and strain on many. We know that giving to God in seasons of upheaval is not easy, but we believe that it's incredibly powerful. And so if you would like to give, you can find all of the information at sb.org.au forward slash give. Well, in the month of May, as a church, Sindel Baptist raises funds to support global interaction in some of the great work that they do in sharing the good news of Jesus around the world. This year, all funds raised will go toward four different projects and teams. One of these projects is an education foundation in Southeast Asia, which offers education and training opportunities to local people from low socioeconomic backgrounds. This educational training is focused on upgrading vocational skills in areas like language acquisition and teaching, healthcare, as well as some practical life skills around budgeting and computer training and organisation. And this enables individuals and families to holistically improve their standard of living, benefiting their entire communities. Lives are being changed through the relationships that the team is forming through the opportunity from this project. And so if you'd like to give or learn more about May Missions Month, simply head to sb.org.au forward slash May Missions for all the details. Well, one of the great privileges that we have as individuals and as a community is to speak and listen to God in prayer. And so we're going to take the opportunity right now to do just that. I'd love for you to join with me. Let's pray together. Loving God in this moment right now, we want to speak with and listen to you. In the stillness or the chaos of our homes right now, we take a moment to pause and direct our focus towards you. As we continue to pray, we choose to rejoice today for all the good that you bring in our lives. In the silence right now, we think of and name the people, opportunities or things for which we can be thankful for today. Caring God, we also want to recognise the uncertainty and challenges which bring fear and anxiety or discomfort to our lives at this time. And so in the silence right now, we think of and we name the people, the circumstances and the things for which we desire your peace and we invite your power to do what only you can do. Powerful God, we bring these things which cause us worry or concern and we declare the words of Psalm 62. My hope is in you. You alone are my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. As we continue to renew our trust in you, we invite you to continue to work in and through us so that others might come to put their trust in you as well. Help us to be known by our love by our generosity and our peace, by all of those in our homes and in our lives. As we listen now to Chris's message, may we hear what it is that you are saying to us through him. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as Chris brings the sermon for today, let's lean in together in anticipation of how we might take our next step in our own journey of faith. Over to you, Chris. Hey, can I say up 
right up front and centre. As bad as it's been, COVID-19 and its twin brother, ISO Life, isn't all that bad. If you look hard enough, there are good things that be found around every corner. ISO Life can even break bad habits, as I've discovered. A few weeks before COVID-19 came to visit, I discovered that McDonald's began to serve iced coffee thick shakes with real coffee in them. I had to try one immediately and discovered that one wasn't enough. After a relatively short period of time, I began to bop in, pop into McDonald's more frequently. If it hadn't have been for COVID-19 and its disturbance of everything, I would be the size of a small water buffalo by now. So for all its downside, COVID-19 may well yet have some upsides. People talk about deepening relationships, getting perspective on what really counts, learning to be grateful for small things, getting connected with less people, but getting connected more closely and more, looking out for one another more. You don't have to look too hard to see that there is a silver lining to this cloud called COVID-19. During this downtime, one of the other things that seems to be happening is we're becoming more aware of the frailty of our humanity and the fickle nature of the things that we rely on to bring us security. Our finances, our jobs, our health, the health of our loved ones all seem to be up in the air right now. No guarantees for anybody. But in this cloud of uncertainty, a silver lining emerges. In the cloud, people seem to be awakening to the idea that there are other things that you can build your life on. During this season, there seems to be lots of people looking for answers that cannot be found in superannuation, career fulfillment, or in the stock markets. Lots of people, it seems, are beginning to see through the idea that any of those things can provide security or peace of mind. This season has made us passengers in all those things, helpless to change them, and where and, and we are in a place, when we're in that place of helplessness, strangely, our eyes tend to look up. We tend to look elsewhere. Even from the most secular of governments and reporters, calls for people across the world to pray. When the foundations have been shaken solidly enough, most of us look at what is left and begin to ask, how can I live my life differently? How can I base my life on something more solid, something more trustworthy, something more lasting? Well, it's good to have you here with us for week three of I Know This Much Is True, where we're focusing on a silver lining that tr trumps all others, the transformative teaching and life of Jesus Christ, a sure foundation for unsure times. In week one, we talked about the power of building your life on knowing and living out the teachers of Jesus. And that idea that Jesus' words are solid ground for us to build our lives on. Loving, forgiving, praying, generosity, trusting, just being a few things that Jesus speaks into in his teachings. If you've finished snorkeling through the Sermon on the Mount, I'd encourage you to keep reading. There's so much more to be found in the Gospels about the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. Last week, we had a look at the authority of Jesus and we looked at it not just from a perspective of what others say, but from what Jesus declared about himself. In essence, the idea that Jesus wasn't just a nice guy with cool teachings, but that he was and he is and he declared himself to be the human image of the living God. Or as the Apostle Paul, the ex-Christian hater, so aptly describes him, Jesus Christ, the Son, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether through thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things that have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. It's a pretty wild claim from a man who was an ex-persecutor of the church. And for some of us, all sorts of questions and doubts arise from such a claim. But to the truly open, to those who are willing to take the leap with Jesus, transformation waits in the storm. Dare I say it, 
That's why some of you are watching. Because like a pebble in your shoe, like a splinter in your mind, you know deep within that whatever this is, it's not enough. Whatever life is dishing up all on its own, it's not doing it for you. And in the darkness of the cloud, when nobody is watching, you say to yourself, surely there must be more to life than this. To you, I say this, Jesus is calling. Maybe you've been asking deep existential questions for years, maybe for months, maybe even just for days. But in the pall of COVID-19, the questions have ramped up. And to you, I say, Jesus is calling. Whether you have a church background or not is largely irrelevant. What you're going to discover this more, at this time is that Jesus calls all types. He called religious types like Saul. He called plain spoken and uneducated types like Saul. He called uh, like Peter and John. He called unsavory types like tax collectors and prostitutes. And today it's no difference. Jesus is still calling. And if you're willing to open your heart, don't look now, but I think he might be calling you. The million dollar question, of course, is if Jesus is calling How can I best position myself to hear him? Do I have to be more religious? Do I have to get my act together, stop getting drunk or being naughty? Do I need to go to church to hear him? Do I need to stop swearing or start reading the Bible? Do I need to memorise and recite the Lord's Prayer? It's interesting to note that many people instantly think that hearing Jesus is all about what we can do. In today's passage, we're going to have a look at what Jesus can do with people like you and like me, if we hear him and if we learn to respond to him. Before we look at that, let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks that you are with us today, wherever we are, and that as we view this, we ask that you would speak to our lives and into our hearts right where we are, right where we're at. We open ourselves to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. When Andrea Bocelli formed, uh, performed songs of hope on Easter Sunday, live from the cathedral in Milan, and it was broadcast worldwide to millions of people, the song that the news outlets in this country and others chose to play was Amazing Grace. The newsreaders, religious and non-religious, raved about its power to bring hope a song of doubt and faith, a song about being lost and found, a song about forgiveness and transformation, a song about the saving love of Jesus Christ, a song that actually has its roots in crying out to God in a storm, written by a slave trader who found Jesus after many, many years of rejecting him. Jesus called out to John Newton in a literal storm and over time that interaction interaction transformed him from a slave trader to a slave abolitionist, from a drunken wreck of humanity to a leader of transformative change in his society. For John Newton, the words of amazing grace were formed from his deeply life-changing experience of Jesus Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Jesus is in the business of dealing with broken people. You'll find it again and again throughout the Gospels that Jesus touches the untouchables, breaks all kinds of social norms to reach the unreachable. If you keep reading the Sermon on the Mount, Uh, After the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 8, you'll find Jesus doing the absolutely unthinkable in touching a leper to heal him. There are so many levels at which this is forbidden in Jesus' society, physical, spiritual, societal. All the normal barriers are broken down by Jesus to bring healing to this man. We're not going to park on this, but needless to say, in the... In a sign up front and centre, it's a sign up front and centre that Jesus is willing to go into forbidden places to heal and restore the broken and broken hearted. In chapter 8, he crosses medical barriers, religious barriers, 
cultural barriers. He names the Gentile as having greater faith than anyone in Israel. He confronts any force that seeks to enslave people and he sets them free. He heals people who, who the rest of society have given up on and rejected. Chapter 8 and 9 are like an all-out assault on religion as it stood. People who should not be touched are touched by Jesus. People who should not be held up as exemplars of the faith are held up by Jesus. People who could not be healed are healed by Jesus. People who should not be walking are enabled to do so by Jesus. And along the way, Jesus takes a wrecking ball to this idea that forgiveness, healing, faith and cleanliness, physical and spiritual, can be earned. As far as Jesus is concerned, these things are given. They are not earned. Now, the thing that Jesus says and does are deeply offensive to the religious folks of his time, but they all pale into insignificance when we look at what happens a few verses later in chapter 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting on the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Jesus meets a guy who is a tax collector and not only does Jesus, Messiah, Lord of all, image of the invisible God, accept Matthew the tax collector as he is, Jesus invites him to be part of his team. It's an absolute scandal. Tax collectors in that culture were despised as greedy, self-serving and parasitic. They grew rich at the expense of the poor by extorting from them more than was required in order to fill their own pockets, like inviting the local drug lord of a totally or a totally corrupt politician or someone that everybody knew was mostly up to no good. Jesus doesn't just have dinner like with Zacchaeus, who Mandy talked about the other week. Jesus asks this socially, morally unacceptable person to come and follow him, to join the team. It's not a good look for the son of God's team. Jesus' standard seems to be well below par in terms of who he calls to follow him. And the religious people of his day are clearly horrified. Archbishop Desmond Tutu said it well. He said, we may be surprised at the people we find in heaven. God has a soft spot for sinners. His standards are quite low. Well, I can speak from experience on that one. Some days i got no idea at all why Jesus would allow me to be on his team. And I'm absolutely certain for his disciples, they had some pretty clear concerns about their positions on the team as well. Peter, when he denied that he knew Jesus. The rest, when they ran away, when he was being beaten and crucified. Thomas, when he got sprung, doubting the resurrection. So pathetically human, all of them. So if you don't think you cut the mustard, come fly with me. A fellow loser, a fellow doubter, a fellow sinner. Jesus picks all sorts to follow him. One of my least favourite things about being a pastor is that the lab- what that label can do to people. Many times I've met a person and we're getting along really well, happily chatting about life, family, sport, all sorts of things. Then the dreaded question, so Chris, what do you do? I say, I'm a minister or a pastor. The reaction is usually instantaneous. They usually look like a rabbit in the spotlight. The eyes widen a little. And then they almost always say, oh, sorry, as they scroll through their memory bank trying to work out whether they've said anything that might be offensive to a priest. It's an absolute conversation stopper. I usually say something like, look, I used to be a boilermaker, so no, I doubt that there's anything you can say that would offend me in this day and age. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The only time it seems to work is that when they know me enough to know that A, I like them, and B, I'm not judging them. Usually it takes at least 18 holes on a golf course or a few hours in other settings to throw off the religious stuff that people put on me. This is what makes Jesus such a mind blower. He is the very son of God, the very image of the invisible God, but he seems to have a happy knack 
of consistently pointing to God without sounding religious. Exhibit A is found in Matthew chapter 9 after he's called Matthew the morally reprehensible tax collector to follow him. Have a look at this and try and get your head around it. Jesus is invited uh, a tax collector to enjoy the te- uh, to join the team and this is what happens next. Whilst Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Just in case you're wondering what ca- uh, tax collectors and sinners means, it means that Jesus welcomed and hung out with all kinds of people. The difference between Jesus and religion is that Jesus sees beyond the labels. A church newsletter in the US placed this cracking welcome to their visitors uh, on on their newsletter, on their opening page. I've changed it slightly to fit an Aussie context. We extend a special welcome to those who are single, married, divorced, gay, filthy rich or dirt poor, don't speak English. We extend a special welcome to those who are crying newborns, skinny as a rail or could afford to lose a few kilos. We welcome you if you can sing like Andrea Pacelli or like our pastor who can't carry a note in a bucket. You're welcome here if you're just browsing, just woke up, just got out of jail. We don't care if you're more Catholic than the Pope or haven't been to church since little Joey's baptism. We extend a special welcome to those who are over 60 but not growing up yet and to teenagers who are growing up far too fast. We welcome soccer mums, supercar dads, starving artists, tree huggers, latte sippers, vegetarians, junk food eaters. We welcome those who are in recovery or still addicted. We welcome you if you're having problems or if you're down in the dumps or if you don't like organised religion. We've all been there too. If you blew all your offering money at the dog track, you're welcome here. We offer a special welcome to those who think the earth is flat, who work too hard, who don't work, who who can't spell, or because grandma is in town and wanted you to go to church. We welcome those who are inked, pierced, or both. We offer a special welcome to those who would use a prayer right now, those who've had religion shoved down their throat as a kid or got lost in traffic and wound up here by mistake. We welcome tourist seekers and doubters, bleeding hearts and you. There it is right there. The difference between Jesus and religion is that Jesus sees beyond the labels. We all put on all sorts of labels to ourselves, don't we? Middle class, lower class, upper class, gay, straight, bogan, yuppie, married, single. But worse than this, we've got internal labels, things that we might not verbalise, but in the darkness, we say them to ourselves repeatedly. That inner monologue that we repeat endlessly, no matter, that no one else hears, but it is on endless repeat in our minds. I'm too fat, too thin, too dumb, too inconsistent, stupid, lazy, weak, gutless, unfaithful, not good enough, not strong enough, not reliable enough, not smart enough, not courageous enough, not resilient enough, not friendly enough, not attractive enough, not successful enough, not good enough, not enough. That's you. That's the kind of chatter that your inner monologue is dishing up to you then you need to hear from Jesus. The difference between Jesus and religion is that Jesus sees beyond labels, even the labels that we put on ourselves. It's interesting to note that when Jesus went to dinner at Matthew's place, surrounded by tax collectors and sinners, it didn't get him the popular vote among the religious folks. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, Why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? This is not a real question. It's not directed at Jesus. It's said behind his back and it's rhetorical. A statement in question form. You know, when Joanne and the kids uh, say to me, you're not going to wear that out, are you? It's not a question. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners is not a question. It's a statement made to undermine Jesus' character. If in eating with sinners, Jesus is breaking a number of rules in relation to ritual cleanliness. And not only that, the type of people that he's hanging out with 
are notorious rule breakers. Religion can only see the rules. It can't see the humanity. Religion is baffled by grace. Religion is all about laws and rules. Religion is a harsh critic and a ruthless taskmaster. It sees people as labels, righteous, unrighteous, clean, unclean, right, wrong. Labels used to sort people into two groups, who's in and who's out. The difference between Jesus and religion is that Jesus sees beyond the labels. Have a look at what Jesus said next. On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Not only does Jesus rip the labels clean off, He calls the Pharisees to take a look at themselves as well. Go and learn what this means. It's like saying to a builder, you need to head back to train school and learn properly. Or to a university professor, you need to go and sit in on the 101 class of your own subject. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, is a call for the religious folks to examine their motives and their thinking. And the quote is from Hosea, an Old Testament prophet who was getting stuck into the religious folks and telling them to stop preserving their religious appearance and get back to the heart of God, a heart of mercy. What does Jesus mean when he says, I've not come to call the righteous but sinners? Is he putting labels on? Is he boxing people? No. Remember, the difference between Jesus and religion is that Jesus sees beyond the labels. Jesus is pointing at the heart. Like Hosea, he's pointing at mercy above sacrifice and real love for God and submission to God rather than empty ritual and self-righteousness. I reckon the best example of what Jesus means here can be found in one of his parables, and I want to finish on that. A little story that Jesus tells in Luke 18 outlines the difference between mercy and sacrifice, the difference between so-called righteous and sinners. It outlines the difference beautifully. The parable goes like this. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, says Jesus, that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. The difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector is all about perspective. One thinks that they are awesome. The other thinks God is. One defines themselves as awesome because of their many sacrifices to obey the religious rules. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. The other knows full well that he doesn't cut the mustard. So he simply places himself at the mercy of God. God have mercy on me a sinner. Only one goes home justified and is not the religious guy. One of the big issues with following Jesus over time is that we can forget where we come from. Like the religious guy in Jesus' parable, we can become so filled with our own good deeds that we become totally blind to our own faults. Smug self-righteousness is a dangerous place to be. And if you're in that place of feeling like You're a little bit better than everyone else. You need to know this much is true. Jesus didn't come to call the so-called righteous, but sinners like you and me. Maybe you're sitting watching and you're at the other end of the spectrum. You think that you're not religious enough for Jesus. Maybe you think that Jesus doesn't really relate to you because of that. Well, know this much is true. 
Jesus didn't come to call the so-called righteous, but he came to call sinners like you and me. You can put a line through yourself all day long. I'm not good enough. I'm not religious enough, not holy enough, not churchy enough, not knowledgeable enough. But if you think that Jesus isn't interested in you because of your shortcomings, you need to know this much is true. Jesus didn't come to call the so-called righteous, but he came to call sinners like you and like me. It's all in the good book. Jesus said himself, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. I don't know about you, but I belong squarely in the sinner category. It's an old word, but it's pretty clear. Someone who does wrong. I'm sure I'm not alone here, but even when my intent is to do right, on some days without even meaning to, I can still find myself doing wrong. Like gravity, no matter how high and mighty we might think we are, if we're to be completely honest and have any self-awareness at all, all of us at some point would have to admit we fall short of our own standards, let alone God's. Sometimes the fall is flat on our faces in front of everybody. Sometimes it's behind the scenes. Where it happens is irrelevant. The fact that it happens, the fact that we fall, is as inevitable as the sun rising in the morning. It's our human nature to hide our defects and show our virtues. But Jesus doesn't want our best angle or our resume on what we can do on a good day. Jesus wants us as we are. He wants to work with us. He wants to heal us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to help us become the kind of men and women he designed us to be. Next week, we're going to talk a lot more about how we can step into that and how we can move in a different way of doing and seeing life. But this week, I want to take the opportunity to come to Jesus as we are. About five years ago, I introduced a really simple prayer that called, uh, that's called the Jesus Prayer. And it's a really simple prayer that conveys humility and levels the playing field. I've never stopped praying it, actually. It's a brilliant prayer for a bad day. It's a brilliant prayer when you know you've fallen short of your own standards. It's a prayer that's been prayed by people over a thousand years for people who wanted healing, forgiveness for themselves and even for others. It's a very similar prayer to the prayer uttered by the tax collector in Jesus' story. It goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's not a prayer to beat yourself up. It's not a prayer to grovel or lower your self-esteem. It's a simple request for mercy in its many forms. When I pray it, I'm out, I pray it when I'm out of my depth. I pray it when I've knowingly sinned or done wrong. I pray it when I'm worried about friends or relatives. I pray it when the world around me looks like it's out of control. It's a prayer for mercy. It's a prayer to someone who knows you and loves you. Importantly, it's a prayer to someone who understands you and can actually do something about your situation and your circumstances, whether those circumstances are self-inflicted or not. I reckon it'd be great if we give that prayer a try right now. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you today as we are and we ask for your mercy. Just bring yourself before Jesus now and name anything that comes to mind, your own dysfunction, the dysfunction of others, your own situation or the situation of others. Ask for whatever you need, be it healing, forgiveness or renewal. Now in our hearts, Lord, we humbly come before you and we pray this simple prayer. Why don't you pray it out loud with me? It's up on your screens. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner.
Thank you, God, that your mercy is new every morning and that your love for us is exemplified in Jesus who loves, forgives, heals and restores sinners just like us. We give you thanks in his name. Amen. It's been great to have you with us this week. And next week, we're going to spend some time looking at how Jesus can help us step into the life we were born for and how he can help us find purpose in the everyday. But this week, can I encourage you to take the Jesus prayer out for a spin. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I think you'll find it a fantastic prayer to pray in almost any situation, and particularly in a season where we have no control. Be sure to give it a go and do that on repeat. Before I hand over to Mike, a little encouragement from the author of the book of Hebrews commenting on about who we're praying to in Jesus. In Jesus, we don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing and experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk up to him right now and get what he's so ready to give. Take the mercy. Accept his help. As you seek Jesus this week, may you find him and may his mercy and grace meet you wherever you are. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that it's been an encouraging time that will continue to bring good in and through your life. For more information, content and opportunities to connect, we'd love for you to subscribe to our Sindel Baptist e-news by sending an email to newsletter at sb.org.au. This way we can better communicate and keep you up to date with all of the great and important things that are going on in this church. We'd love to have you join us next Sunday as well for another Sindel Baptist House Church service. But until then, have a great rest of your day and week. And until next time, grace and peace to you all.